world this week. Seven days, four Paris space correspondents, one hour. Vivian Walt of Time Magazine is with us. How are you? Very good. Also with us, Anne Penkett, uh, who writes for The Independent, and, and, and is just... Tell us about this, Anne, because it's absolutely amazing. I have just written a novel in a month. It's part of the challenge. National November Writing Month. You have to produce 50,000 words from the 1st to the 30th of November. And I finish this afternoon. Yay. One day early. One day early. and it, yeah. it, it'll. I've got my winner certificate. And it will, be in, it, it will hit the stores before Christmas, I hope. <laughs> we'll see. Not Ulrike. on Black Friday. <laughs> we'll talk about Black Friday later. <laughs> Ulrike Kolterman, former Barris Bureau Chief for the German news agency DPA. Thank you for being with us. And thanks as well to Craig Kapitas of Quartz and The Atlantic, The World This Week on Facebook and on Twitter, our hashtag TWTW. Like clockwork, we are here every Friday uh, writing in daily newspaper The National. Alan Phillips reminds us that punctuality is the courtesy of kings, which brings us to the subject of one Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin. <clears throat> when in Rome this week, the Russian president kept the Pope waiting for 50 minutes. Um, a closer week at the look at the week's news, and you'd be tempted to add that politically, well, I guess Putin can afford it. Craig Capitas, he kept the Pope waiting 50 minutes. We, I understand that um, this is nothing new, that uh, he kept Angela Merkel waiting 30 minutes, and he kept John Kerry waiting, the U.S. Secretary of State, three hours. And he beat up Chuck Norris in a fight three nights ago outside of St. Petersburg. Putin is the most powerful politician in the world right now. Putin has won the game. You know, Big Pharma goes to him. They tap his blood to make more powerful strains of Viagra and, and Botox. Uh, he, is, he is the man. He, he controls it. He is the new global strongman. Francois Hollande, this fellow who runs England, whose name escapes me, Obama, <laughs> they, um, they're just not there. Put, Putin, Putin has... Putin has won the game. Ulrike, keeping the Pope waiting for 50 minutes. Well, compared to Merkel, I don't know if there's a hierarchy in the, <laughs> the number of minutes he keeps people waiting, but to me it looks as if he just doesn't have digested the fact that he's not a superpower anymore. So it's these little gestures to make himself big, but uh, he, he shouldn't do that. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Vivian Wall? Well, it's one of the kind of classic manipulative tactics of politicians. I remember Berlusconi once kept Ber um, Obama waiting for quite a long time. You know, when you need to strut your stuff on the world stage, this is a perfect way to do it. You're not uh, lobbying any lobbing any bullets, you're just uh, late. And uh, it shows the other person that you're somebody to be reckoned with. Putin, who, by the way, on that trip to Italy, went and saw Berlusconi just before he was <laughs> right. uh, banned from, from parliament. Um, uh, while in Italy, Putin was asked about the strong words out of Brussels, this after Ukraine. At the end of last week, made an about face and pulled out of a treaty with the European Union. Instead, uh, choosing Moscow. Uh, the European Commission blasting the Russian president for effectively blackmailing Ukraine into pulling out of that deal with Europe. We are not prepared to open our market to European goods within two months. Therefore, I would ask our friends in Brussels, my good friends in the European Commission, to refrain from strong words. Should we kill the entire branches of our industry to please them? And Penkett. It is blackmail. Of course it's blackmail. But, you know, the EU in this, they were just a shambles, frankly, because they allowed him, once again, to run rings around them. I, I, I just wonder if they have ever got to grips with the fact that Russia is not going to let anything happen in his backyard. And we've seen it with NATO, and now we've seen it once again with this, this so-called neighbourhood agreement with, with Ukraine. But the question is, why did we come to such a situation where, and this is perhaps partly also Brussels' fault, where it comes down, boils down to a choice between East or West? I just, just think that Putin outmaneuvered them, really. Um, the, the thing with Ukraine is that Ukraine itself is facing East and West, mm. and Putin knows that. Because it's not like Georgia, which is mostly Georgian, mm -hmm. ethnic Georgian people. Ukraine has a large Russian 
uh, ethnic minority. So you've got the, the Ukrainians themselves leaning westwards and the Russians still still looking to Moscow. And I, I, would suggest it goes, I would suggest that it goes a bit further than that, Francois, because there is a, 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 a substantial but not large Ukrainian Catholic population, which has always kind of gone more towards Europe. But the Ukraine is principally orthodox, and there, that you can never underplay the orthodox connection, yeah, even in Putin's being late to see the pope, because Putin has made himself the de facto political head of the Russian Orthodox But, but Craig, we've seen over the past couple of years that relations between Putin and his Russian-speaking counterpart, Mr. Yanukovych, mm -hmm. have at times been very frayed. Ukraine, which pays over the odds, for instance, for its natural gas. They've always been frayed, historically. But at the proverbial end of the day, the Ukrainians in the eastern port of the country the Orthodox, the Slavophiles, will always side with Russia. Look, let's not make a mistake about this. The history of the Ukraine has historically been firmly in the Russian camp, not, not in the European camp. The, 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 a lot of people in the Ukraine want to obviously want to join the European Union, but as Anne said, there is no way that Vladimir Putin is going to let this happen. I mean, to me, it just seems it's it's more than, of course, just outmaneuvering Europe. It's also outspending them hugely. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Putin came and he had billions to offer. The Europeans had six six hundred million or something. Um, and more than that, it just seemed like the European leaders stood up there and said, "Well, you know, of course, Ukraine would want to join Europe. Why wouldn't they? You know, we have Western democracy and all these wonderful things to offer them." Um, and it, it seemed a little tone deaf to me. On that score, let me get you to react, Vivian, to um, some comments. The polls and Swedes, particularly miffed by Kiev's, Kiev's about face, the Swedish foreign minister, Carl Bildt, who bluntly wagged the finger at Putin, but also at Ukraine's president earlier in the week. Uh, this is what he tweeted uh, early this Friday from the Vilnius summit that's been taking place between uh, the EU and Eastern Europe. Yeah. Uh, saying President Yanukovych must show uh, what we what he wants. Rumors that he's promised to leave the European energy community would kill an association agreement. Built saying uh, that uh, this is Yanukovych playing both sides against the middle a little too much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. I mean, everybody playing everybody against everybody. But um, it seems to me, obviously, he's in a very difficult situation. He's facing um, an election campaign. Uh, for one thing, he needs the funds for that election campaign. And uh, he obviously has, as uh, Anne was saying, a huge base within Ukraine that is not, uh, you know, that favorable to Europe. And on that score, uh, Yanukovych this week implying that Putin made him an offer that he couldn't refuse. I need to make complicated decisions. That's why I sometimes run the risk of being misunderstood. And that's why I'm asking our people today to listen to me carefully. I will never take any step which could harm Ukraine and its people. The will of the Ukrainian citizens was, is, and will be the justification of each of my decisions. I think the main problem is that uh, Europe totally underestimated the influence of Russia. I mean, it's been six years of negotiation, so it's a huge disappointment that it comes to this end now. And there's also the fate of Yulia Timoshenko, the former prime minister, who is still in jail, who's back on hunger strike, and who is waiting to go to Germany. But uh, obviously, this plays a big role in these negotiations. Uh, and we, we can show you live images that are coming in. Uh, from Ukraine, where we've now had uh, daily demonstrations uh, from the opposition. Uh, the biggest since the 2004 Orange uh, Revolution, among those showing up in Vilnius uh, for that summit earlier, now back in Kiev, a rising star in Ukrainian politics that sports fans know well, heavyweight boxing champion Vitaly Klitschko. We want to live in Europe with European family, with European standards of life, with European laws. And that's why it's our goal to change the uh, president, to change the government, and to sign a session agreement with the European Union. 
But it does bring you back, Ann Penkett, to what we were talking about at the outset. Vladimir Putin, who, again, he's had a pretty good run. Uh, there's been the Snowden affair where he's <laughs> been uh, the, the man uh, uh, harboring uh, Edwards, the, the, the whistleblower there. Mm. There's uh, the Syria deal where he stood up to Obama mm. at that summit. And now this. Absolutely. I mean, he, he is just laughing all the way to the bank, really, isn't he? As, as, as Craig was saying, he, he is now strutting on the international stage. He's but, the perfect autocrat. Well, dictatorships or quasi-dictatorships, they are going to trump democracies all the way down the line, every time. And sadly, this is what's ah, happening so you bring with, up, you, with you, Russia you, now. You bring up a really interesting point, Anne. Do the people of Russia... Mm really want a democracy as much as the people of Russia back in our day when we were there covering the fall of the Communist Party wanted to get rid of the Communist Party. Maybe I, perhaps I'm being cynical, but I do not believe they do because although Putin has his opponents who he stifles, mm. the polls consistently, even if they are mm -hmm. manipulated, you walk to Russia, you talk to average Russians, He's their Chuck Norris. Well, Russians, like most people, want stability, don't exactly. they? Exactly. And Putin brings it. And that's the one thing that every Russian leader who's been successful has had to do, bring stability to the country. And that's what Putin's done. And it goes back to this point. Is Jeffersonian democracy tomorrow's model for government? A lot of people don't mm. think it is anymore. Mm. We're going to graduate now to our consumer news segment over in the United States. It's the long Thanksgiving weekend, but it's not all feasting and watching American <coughs> football on television. Yes, there's also shopping. <coughs> Black Friday, the day after Thanksgiving, launches the Christmas shopping season in America. Major retailers this year introducing a new wrinkle. Stores open as early as Thanksgiving Thursday. As you've by now surmised, Americans take their shopping seriously. Contrast that, if you will, with Europe's largest economy. Germans squirrel away their savings uh, much more and keep less cash to hand. There you see the percentage of disposable income over the past uh, couple of years. Theirs is, yes, a dr export-driven economy. But wait, is that all about to change? German Chancellor Angela Merkel this week announcing a grand coalition with the Social Democrats is the loosening of the purse strings in the offing, Ulrika Kolterman. Well, sort of. There are some goodies to be doled out, but uh, basically the German politics won't change not much, especially on international level. If Europe was waiting for a big change, that's a, no, there won't be a big change. And uh, the good news is that finally things are moving ahead because it, it's an awkward situation. She had a landslide victory two months ago and there's still no government in place. And uh, her opposition partner, her coalition partner, the former opposition could blackmail her saying that they have to ask the, their members if they agree with the coalition agreement. And now finally we have these 185 pages and still we have to wait for the vote of the militants, of the members of the December SPD. December will be. And then it will be mid-December. Yeah. So for Christmas we probably have a government then. But, but the idea that... Uh a lot of people have been criticizing, it was most notably the U.S. Treasury that was very loud about it, even the IMF saying, why don't Germans spend just a little bit more money at home? Is any of that going to change? There's a little bit, yeah. I mean, the, obviously, she has to. they have to distribute some presents after the elections, especially the, the SPD was asking for money to distribute. So there will be higher pensions, and some people can retire early, and especially the minimum wage, with, which was a big issue in the election campaign, they have it in the coalition agreement. It will come. It's eight euro fifty per hour. That means that a lot of people will earn more money, but it also means that a lot of people will just lose their jobs because uh, the employers can't afford it anymore. So the labor market reforms that have begun under Chancellor, the Social Democrat Chancellor Schröder, Merkel is moving away from it with this um, ref with with um, the minimum wage because uh, it means that uh, it's going to be more difficult for, for people to get back into work if they're unemployed. All right, so the pendulum's going to swing. We don't know how much. Is that going to change things in Europe, where everybody's Nothing. waiting for those trade imbalances to uh, level off? I don't see anything changing uh, until the Germans start buying jumbotron televisions. And, you know, I mean, I, my, I've always wondered, do Germans 
buy each other Christmas gifts, you know, for the holiday <laughs> season? Is this a way to... Did you have a Black Friday? You know? Do you do that in Germany? No, they did in the UK this year. I mean... Plus, you have two Christmas days, right? Because it's St. Nicholas on December 6th, so shouldn't you be buying That's lots right. of presents? <laughs> you have two Christmases in Germany and you can't get, get your spending up? What is wrong with your people? People are spending money, but there is also a real problem with poverty because of the labor market reforms under Chancellor Schröder. Yes, it's true. People, it's it's easier to hire and fire people, but uh, since then poverty is rising, and people who are unemployed after one year they lose their benefits, and that is a real problem in Germany. It doesn't hurt the, in the United States. They just keep getting cheap credit and going out and buying some more. See, that's the big difference. You know, Germany. America spends too much money that it doesn't have. And well, Germany, America can print its own money, print it, whereas yeah, as they want. Germany yeah. cannot, cannot, for one thing. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a really, uh, it's a tale of two cities type of story. But we're all hanging on now, waiting to see what you do. And so as long as Germany doesn't kind of kick into gear, what are, what's going to happen to the rest of us? Well, it is a problem that uh, Germany was paralyzed with these elections for months. It was paralyzed during the election campaign, it was paralyzed around the elections and now forming a new government. So for half a year, nothing has happened. But uh, as I said, on European level, nothing will really change. Mm. The Social Democrats mm. ask for more money and maybe uh, go into direction of mutualization of debts, but this will not happen with Angela Merkel. Her uh, position is clear right from the beginning. Everyone has to take care of his own budget and especially the countries in the South, they have to look into their own budget and they have to make an effort and do the ref reforms that Germany has done 10 years before. So uh, there will be no movement towards um, a more, uh, more openness or more mutualization, mutualization of death that just will, won't happen. And, 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 of course, the consequence for Europe is that rut that, uh, that the continent's been in, what, for the past couple of years will continue. Yeah, but you have strange things happening. For example, if you look at the UK, we, we, we're in another bubble, uh, which is a housing market bubble. You know, H house prices have never risen so fast for a long, long time. Over the past year, you know, people are now putting in sealed bids for property because it's, it's been going up so much, probably rich foreigners, not necessarily Brits, but still, and that's now becoming a worry mm. because the economy is overheating. Yeah, it's a, you know, again, another excellent point. Um, uh, a, a gentleman I know, John Leonardo from um, Sperry Van Ness Commercial Real Estate in the United States, he was in town this week, and he was talking about this real estate bubble and how it was affecting the state of Florida, which obviously had this huge condominium bubble. He says that now that these condos, which everyone didn't want. They're now turning into commodities and people, as you were saying, are paying cash. They're not the Americans, mm -hmm. but they're the foreigners coming in and paying the cash. Mm -hmm. So, and there are Germans there too, and Latin Americans. So All it's right, turning so into a cash economy. So be careful mm -hmm. of real estate. Bitcoin. And, 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 yeah, Bitcoin. 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 And, and, watch, <laughs> and, watch the, and watch the cash. We'll follow the money. We're going to follow the money some more when we come back with the world this week. Stay with us. Thank you.